everybody, Billabo10000 here, bringing you another episode of 999, and at the moment, I'm trying to get these keys to work, but I managed to unlock these because you can actually go back and select where you want to go in each of the different levels. So, we need to head back to this area, and we actually need to head into the operating room, and we need to activate chemical closet and before the door. So, I guess we should... Let me just make sure that we're on the right track. Okay. Gonna head into the operating room. Let's go to chemical closet first. You think we should go- Yeah. And I'm just gonna skip ahead until I find a choice, potentially. Okay, here we go. Oh, I completely- Uh, June told me he was talking about the freezer. We heard about this in the freezer. Hmm. Ice that doesn't melt at room temperature. Yeah, this is, um, so basically on this path, guys, uh, let me just kind of update you on what's happening. So we decided to take the pathway that went with June, Lotus, and Santa at the beginning of the game. We collected the bookmark from Santa, and we learned about Ice Nine in the freezer. That uh, triggers certain events in extra areas like this one. So now, ice that doesn't melt at room temperature? Huh. Now we're gonna continue and that activate more. Yeah, hold on. I, I feel like I can remember something. It's right there. And I'm gonna go back into the novel screen, just to make sure. Seven squinted. His eyes stared off into space as if he were trying desperately to focus on something far away. Do you... Know something about Ice Nine? Do you know about Ice Nine? Ice Nine? Ice Nine. Ice Nine. I'd like to know if he does. Ice. 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 Baby. Butter, 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 butter. <laughs> Suddenly Seven's eyes shot open. That's it. I remember now. That woman, she's on this boat. What? A woman? That woman? Alice! Alice? I remember Elise, the the book, the hieroglyph book that we see later on. Who's Alice? Come on, the woman who won't melt at room temperature. What? Huh? It became clear to Seven that Junpei had no idea what he was talking about. He ran his hand across his face and took a deep breath. You know how the Titanic sank on April 15th, 1912, Yes. Right? Yeah. More than 1,500 people died. Worst maritime accident in history. Exactly. What about it? Did you hear about the boat that was sent to collect the dead bodies? Uh, I think that was the RMS Carpathia, right? How does he know this? It was a cruise liner, just like the Titanic. How? No, that was the ship that picked up the survivors. Oh. The ship that collected the dead bodies was the C.S. McKay Bennett. The McKay Bennett. The McKay Bennett showed up on April 17th. Two days after the accident, it set out from Halifax, a port in Canada, and recovered 306 bodies. All right, so 306 bodies. What's the point? The Atlantic that far north was really cold. It would have to be for there to be icebergs and stuff. Anyway, the bodies they pulled out of the water were frozen solid. Damn. This isn't a very nice story. So, what happened next? Well, they say the McKay Bennett recovered something more than just dead bodies. There were various bits of stuff floating around in the water. Things the drowned had carried with them, or stuff that dislodged as the ship... So just a bunch of random riffraff that you just find in the ocean. One of the things they found was a coffin. Oh, this could be about June's coffin thing with the Titanic, about how they were transporting an ancient Egyptian uh, coffin on the Titanic or something like that. A coffin? Yeah, a wooden one. And inside of it? The craftsman who made it must have been pretty skilled. Mm. It wasn't just a wooden coffin. It was all wood. No nails, no reinforcements, no gaps in the wood anywhere. The thing was airtight. The crew got pretty curious about what might be inside it and opened it up. And? They had to get a wedge and hammer it open. It was so well made. Inside. They found a woman. Whoa. Or, I guess you should say, they found the dead body of a woman. So, um, fun fact, she looks like a character from, uh, Virtue's Last Reward. It's on, literally, it's on the load-up screen of the, the, the game. That's interesting. Her hair was thick and black, and her skin rich brown with no blemishes or signs of decomposition. They say that she looked gorgeous, like a goddess. She was obviously dead, but everyone who looked at her said she just looked like she was sleeping. Damn. Her skin was so lifelike, she looked like she might wake up any minute. And she didn't, though. Like the rest of the bodies they found, she was frozen solid. Eventually, the McKay Bennett finished searching and returned to Halifax. The 306 bodies were unloaded and taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to thaw. They say that the stink was horrible, but there was one body that didn't thaw. And that was Alice. And that was... The girl in the coffin. That's right. 
everybody thought for sure that she'd melt and start to rot like the rest of them eventually. but she never did so june's story has a lot of uh well it's basically just been proven true here that's interesting but weeks passed and nothing happened and a month passed and another and it was summer and she was still frozen solid damn after a while people started to say she was some sort of miracle rumors about her started to spread People came to visit Halifax from all over. After a while, people started to call her All Ice. Like the book. And she looks like she's from Egyptian times, so that hieroglyph book we find later on theoretically could be about her. Alice. Of course, those rumors didn't last long. Why? Well, she up and disappeared. One day Alice was there, the next day she wasn't. So either she was kidnapped or she actually woke up. They say someone snuck into where they were keeping her and stole the body. With the body gone, the rumors followed pretty quickly. After a while, no one remembered her. Damn. You might be able to find something about her if you could find a newspaper from back then, but that's about that's it. That's actually quite insane. Wait, you just said that she was on this boat. Yeah, I did. Alice has got to be somewhere on this ship. And why? Now why the hell would you say something like that? Because I know. How do you know? And just what is it you know? What happened to Alice after she was still- Oh. Junpei gulped. Alright. Tell me. What happened to I'll Alice? I'll bite. Seven nodded slowly and took one look at the man- Uh, wait, no. And took on the look of a man recalling something long buried. Well, around that time, the word was that there was a special black market in New York. All millionaires from all over the and world. And somebody kidnapped her and sold her on a black market. Dre! Great! Brilliant! I've heard that Alice went up for auction there. The person who won the auction was Lord Dashiell Gordain. The guy who owned the Gigantic. You've heard that name before, right? Lord Gordain. Oh, isn't he the guy who bought the Gigantic? The Titanic sister ship. And this is yeah, the Gigantic. We are on the well, Gigantic. Guess he done that yet. What do you mean? Gordain bought Alice in 1912. And four years later, in 1916, he bought the Gigantic. And he hid Alice somewhere on the Gigantic. But nobody knows where. He died in 1930, and apparently he died without ever telling anyone where Alice was hidden. And if we're on the Gigantic, then that means Alice is on the ship. However... However... Well, he did have one close friend who asked him, where is Alice? And he said, Alice sleeps in a small chamber past the Forest of Knowledge, beneath the navel of the Gigantic. The Forest of Knowledge is a library. We get a library key later on in the route. Are we gonna go find Alice? What the hell is that? Is it some kind of riddle? Your guess is as good as mine. Seven threw his hands up in defeat. It's obviously That's a library. It. Whatever you think, I believe it. She's hidden somewhere on the Gigantic. In other words, she's hidden somewhere on this ship. Hmm. Before Junpei could dispute Seven's rather bizarre claim, as Junpei was trying to figure out what on earth he was going to say next, Clover comes back in, yeah. Hey, what are you to stop wasting- Yeah, okay. okay. This is the normal stuff. We've heard this. Yeah, so it might be useful someday. Yep, and Alice. skip that. Left to ponder what he just heard, he tried to remember what June had told him earlier. That mummy that wasn't, wasn't just, just a normal a mummy. mummy. It was Alice. They say that she was frozen. It was Alice. The story says that from the time of its discovery all the way through to when it got put on the Titanic, even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. It was Alice. Then was that Egyptian priestess, Alice? Did the water in her body become Ice Nine? Damn. No, that, that's nuts. There's no way somebody like that could exist. Well, they do because she was put up for auction. Junpei shook his head trying desperately to clear it and followed Seven to the operating room. All right, now let's head to before the door. The silence grew heavier. Come on, what do you want to do? Uh, told Clover they needed to leave, gave her the four-leaf Clover. Oh, yeah. He didn't know how or why, but suddenly Junpei remembered something he'd been given earlier. It's in my pocket somewhere. Um, ah, here it is. All right. He reached into his pocket and dug it out. A four-leaf Clover. For Clover. Santa had given it to him in the second-class uh, second room. He held it out to Clover. Hey, did you know? Each leaf means something. Hope, faith love and luck oh wow i like how this is interconnecting the the whole thing that's what a four-leaf clover stands for take it use it as a good luck charm he pressed the four-leaf clover into her hand listen to me clover no matter what happens you can never lose hope 
you have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith and to have love. Aww. If you can remember all of those, that'll bring you good luck. <laughs> Snake, I, I mean, your brother, he's not dead. He's alive somewhere. I, I'm sure of it. You've just got to believe Yeah, him. about that belief. That's, uh, no. <laughs> he did. Clover stared at the four-leaf clover in her hand. He could see tears start to form at the corner of her eyes. Thank you. Her voice was tiny and broken, and as she spoke, she started to cry. She tried to hide her tears by looking at the floor, but it did little good. She wiped away tears over the baggy arms of her jacket, but more quickly took their place. No matter how she tried, she couldn't stop crying. Her tears made small wet circles on the floor. Thank you. Aww. She said it again. Then she looked back up at Junpei and seemed to choke down the last of her grief. Maybe she won't go crazy with an axe this time. She did her best to smile. Junpei wiped an errant tear from her cheek with his thumb and gave her the best smile he could manage. Now oh, come on. Seven's waiting for us at the exit. But still, she didn't move. Wait, before we go, there's one thing I want to ask you. Okay. What's that? What do you think when you hear the word experiment? Oh. I don't know. For a moment, his mind throws. Then he came back to his senses and realized the word meant nothing to him aside from the dictionary definition. Uh, what? Oh. Huh. I guess it was just a coincidence then. Oh. I mean, that you knew about the four-leaf clover. What? Uh, look, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't want to be a jerk, but you are making less than no sense right now. Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing. Just forget no, about it. No, I want to know. What is this about an experiment? Have you been in an experiment in your past, Clover? Oh, don't don't give me that. Uh, you really think I could just drop this? What is this experiment you were talking about? Clover looked away. The four-leaf clover was still in her hand. She stared at it for a long moment and then finally spoke. You promise you won't tell anyone? No, no, I'm not telling anyone. Come on, let's go. Let's get some gossip. Really? Yeah. Really. I can trust you, right? You can trust me. Of course you can. Clover slipped the four-leaf clover into her pocket. Her eyes still red from crying, she looked up at Junpei. Okay then, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what happened on this ship nine years ago. What? Wait, wait, wait. On this ship? Yeah, this ship. He was entirely lost. He had 1,000 questions, but it was probably best he thought to save them until Clover had finished. It was an experiment to test some sort of psychic thing, communicating through these fields that you can't see. The morphogenetic field theory. The morphogenetic field. Okay, so that's how that's wrapping into it. So, an experiment. Clover was a part of the experiment. Would that imply that Snake was also a part of the experiment since they're siblings and they're so close? And they were so calm about this entire ordeal? Fields that you can't see? God, this is just insinuating a lot. He'd heard something like this before. Clover nodded. Like, think about this. She pointed at the operating table. On top of it was a somewhat mismatched medical mannequin whose parts had been swapped with another mannequin. This is John, right? But is he really John? Huh? That's insane. All John Pay could really think was she has finally completely lost it. Isn't this like Locke's socks? Or the ship of Theseus? I don't know these references, Clover. You might want to explain to me. Um... Junpei grew even more confused. He'd never heard of either of those things, although they sounded smart. You don't know? You haven't heard of those paradoxes? No. No? Junpei shook his head. Really? Clover laughed. Okay, well pay attention then. This is how Locke's socks works. Let's say I've got a pair of socks. They're my favorite socks. Okay. One of them gets a hole in it. What would you do if that was your sock, Junpei? Uh, patch it up or throw it away. Well, if it was your favorite, I, I mean, I'd, I'd throw them away. I'm gonna be honest, I'd throw them away. Well, I'd pitch it, I guess. But it's your favorite pair of socks. Come on, who loves their socks that much? It doesn't matter. Just suppose you do love them that much. Nobody loves mm. them that much. Well, uh, I guess then I'd patch yeah. it. Yeah. But what if another hole opens? Oh, I know this paradox. It's when you patch something up so much that it's not the original sock or the original thing to begin with. So is it really that thing to begin with? I'd add another patch, I suppose. What if another hole opened after that? 
Um, another patch, I guess? Well, let's say you just keep adding new patches until eventually the original cloth of the sock is totally gone. Once you get to that point, can you really say they're the same socks you started exactly, with? Exactly, you can't. Hmm. Uh, well, that... That's... Oh, that, that's tough. Well, in a sense, they're not the same socks you started with, but they're an entirely new being that you're even more happy with because you did it yourself. Junpei crossed his arms. So, that's the lock socks thing? Okay. Yeah. The ship of Theseus is a lot like it. The ship of Theseus. If you keep fixing the damaged parts of a ship, eventually it ends up with none of the parts it started with. Yeah. Can you really say that ship is the same one you started with? No, actually. And what if you took all the old parts from the first ship and built another one somewhere else? Well, then that's the new ship of Theseus. Then which ship is the real ship of Theseus? God damn, that's tough. The one you repaired, or the one you built with all the original parts? Hmm. It was an interesting question. Clover could see Junpei was intrigued. Hey, do you think it's the same? What's the same? These guys. Is this John? Or is it Lucy now? That's tough. Junpei looked at the operating table again. Uh... A mannequin full of body parts from a different body. Clover had been right. It was just like Locke's socks in the ship of Theseus. The part of the body that holds a person's identity is the head. Of course, for many hundreds of years, conventional wisdom had held that a man's identity resided in his heart, or any of a number of internal organs. And here, they had both. John's head and heart are both his, but apart from those, and a single arm, the rest of his body was once loose. Well, the head and the heart are technically your own, because the head is- it's your brain. And that's what really controls the body. Your heart is also the same as well, but I'm pretty sure you can get heart transplants? I don't remember if that's a thing or not, though. Was that mannequin really John? We're just like these mannequins. Oh. She looked at Junpei again. Think about it. The cells in our body change every day. Old ones die, and new ones are born. Maybe part of my arm is made of stuff from a fish I ate once. That's really weird to think about. Or maybe part of your right side is made from a cow you ate. Does that mean that I'm made of chocolate? If you take it a little further, those cows and fishes are made from something else too, right? That's how we're all connected, through fields that can't be seen with the naked eye. That's insane. This game is making me think. The silence was broken by seven. Oh, right. Hey, what the hell is taking you two so long? <laughs> I forgot. I want to know more about the lab. Seven said appeared in the doorway. He was not happy. How long are you going to make me wait? We don't have time to screw around. <sighs> Fine. Junpei and Clover looked at each other. Clover looked at Junpei as if to say there was more she wanted to tell him. She shook her head. Whatever she had to tell him, she didn't want to tell him in front of Seven. Seven seemed to catch on. Oh? What were you two doing? Was this some sort of secret meeting? It's just something you don't need to be bothered about, Seven. Get the fuck away. No, it wasn't. We were just... Just... Gossiping. Playing. With the mannequins. That's the worst excuse ever, Clover. Huh? Let's go, Junpei. Moving a little bit too fast to be entirely innocent, Clover headed toward the exit. Seven stared after her, then turned to Junpei with an amused expression. Playing with mannequins, huh? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Didn't know you were into that kind of thing, Junpei. Uh, <sighs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> You're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Junpei dashed past him and traced Clover's path out of the door. With a short laugh, Seven followed. They stood in front of the door, and that's when the flow chart changes. What? We can't access it, though, goddammit. Alright. You don't need- <sighs> Alright. Do we actually have to go through this little bit? Yes, we do. We have to go through this bit. Yes, we do. All right. Hey, man. So, can't you sound more? No, we've heard <sighs> this. Not really. Gotta skip it. <sighs> My bro, I'm going. Ah. Uh, like hell, I can. Not after hearing. Okay, that's done. All right. So once we've done that, we can now head down here. We're gonna try and get this little bit over here, and we obviously need to unlock all of these locks in the escape rooms. I don't know what the ending's gonna be, but given that there's no escape room after it, I assume it's probably gonna be an ending that pairs well with the axe ending. So let's head to the chart room and let's trigger the pocket watch. A voice he hadn't expected startled Junpei from his examination of the pocket watch. Oh, pocket. All right, let's just stick around hey. to- oh, just... Yeah, there is. Oh. You checked on us, now get out of here. 
We split this stuff up for a reason, all right? Whoa. That's a lie. We didn't have to split up the work. I just want to talk to Clover alone. Fair enough. Okay, that, I think that's what I wanted to do. That's why I sent Ace to the wheelhouse. There's something I want to ask her, and I don't want anyone to overhear. Okay, us. that's brilliant. I'm pretty sure Clover won't talk if there's anyone else around. That's why when Ace showed up again, I got a little desperate. I had to make him- Yeah, move. Ace, get the fuck out. Ace opened his mouth, then took another look at Junpei and shut it again. A small smirk appeared on his face. Oh. Okay. I apologize. I've heard this before as well. Goodbye. Leave. Get out. Out. Shoo. Goodbye. <sighs> okay. Junpei let out a sigh and brushed a few drops of sweat from his forehead. Oh, I remember! Because if we didn't have the right uh, stuff done, then we sort of blacked out for a moment until Ace came back. But now, I guess we get time to talk with Clover. He turned and found himself looking straight into Clover's eyes. She'd heard what Ace had said. She regarded Junpei with caution. What was that about? She was clearly suspicious and with good reason. Why are you looking at me like that? I just that? want to chat. I want to know about your whole lab thing. Junpei's eyes widened and he held up his hands in a gesture of innocence. Oh, uh, no, 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 it's not like that. What's it like then? I just wanted to hear the rest of that story. I didn't get a chance to ask you about it until now. What story? About the experiment, remember? The one you started to tell me in the operating mm -hmm. room? You said something about an experiment that happened here nine years ago. Clover bit her lip. She stared down at the floor for several long moments, and when she spoke, it was barely audible. I'm sorry, but I don't want to talk about that right now. All right, that's fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just not in the mood, okay? Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Uh. You understand, right? I'm just... I keep thinking about my brother. No, it's fine. It's okay. He may be dead, but it's fine. I, I can't stop. I mean, who would do something like that? To my no, it's fine. <sighs> I can't forgive them. I'm not gonna let them get away with it. They're gonna pay for it. I promise. But just not with an axe, okay? So, so... Attack them with words. Her shoulders were shaking. Drops of blood had sprung up from her lips where she was biting them. She wiped it off and looked up at Junpei, her eyes fierce and angry. Junpei, who do you think did it? Her voice was cold and scarcely above a whisper. Junpei gulped. Well, if what Seven said was right, then there would have to be at least two of Two them. people would have had to do it, yeah. You need at least three people to open the numbered doors. And if you subtract Snake, that means there were at least two other people. Yep. You're right. So, what does that mean? Two people had to have betrayed us. Well, if we just look at the bracelet numbers, we should be able to figure it out. Who could have opened door three with Snake? Well, really, who and who, or who, who, and who? You mean it could have been four people? It could have. Well, technically, it's possible. Um, I don't know. That doesn't seem very likely. Well, let's go through the... Let's go through the digital routes that we could have made. Why? Um... I'll tell you later. Why don't we just assume it was only two other people for now? Okay, uh, got it. Let's do that then. Then who do you think it could be? Junpei crossed his arms and thought. Snake's bracelet number was two, which two bracelet numbers added to two would give the digital root of three. Okay. Oh god, we gotta go for it. So Ace and Santa, that would be four. Added to that would be two, which would be six. Impossible. Ace and June would be seven. Added to the two would be nine, impossible. Ace and seven would be eight. Added to that would be two, which makes the digital root of one, which is impossible. Uh, Lotus would be eight. Ace would be nine. Plus two would make a digital root of two, but we're looking for a digital root of three. Uh, would it be Santa and June? Santa, digital root of three. June, digital root of six. That's nine. Add that to Snake would be 11, so that's a digital root of two. Santa and seven. Seven plus three uh, plus two would be 12. So that would be a digital root of three. That's possible, but I just want to check the others. Santa and Lotus, eight plus three is 11, plus two is 13, so that would be your digital root of four. Impossible. June plus seven would be six plus seven, which is 13. Then add on to the two would be 15, so that's a digital root of six. Impossible. June and Lotus, eight plus six would be 14, plus two would be 16, which would be a digital root of seven. And then seven and Lotus, it would be 15 plus two, which is seven. No, so it's... It's Santa and Seven. Would it be Santa and Seven? Which we actually know about because that was what she said in the ending of the axe ending. 
2 plus 3 plus 7 equals 12, 1 plus 2 is 3. The digital root for snake, Santa, and 7 is... 3. 3! Wait, hold on. Are Santa and 7 the killers? Literally no other two-person combination works. <sighs> What's wrong? Clover looked at Junpei and he looked back at her. There was no point in hiding it. Well, I thought about it, and... He told her his conclusions. That's what I thought. She looked less surprised than he'd expected. Santa and Seven. She must have made up the conclusions before I did. If it was two people, then that's the only combination that works. Hey, wait a minute there. Don't you think it's a little too early to be jumping to conclusions? I agree. She is taking things too fast. I just don't... I don't think that Santa or Seven really would kill anyone. I know they'd be driven to insanity in a sense, but I don't think Seven would. He seems too puppy dog. Well, all I said is that those two would have been able to open door three with your brother. There might be other possibilities. Well, what other possibilities? Uh, um... He didn't have an answer. He was ready to admit defeat when Clover spoke. Are you saying you think that it was three or four people? I really don't think that's likely. Why not? Can I borrow your pen and paper? She's gonna spell it out for us. Thank God I don't have to do any work myself. Clover put her hand out expectantly. Yeah, here. Jinpei pulled out his pen and pad off paper and handed them to her. She opened the notebook and wrote down several simple addition problems. Eventually, she had eight, which proved a digital root of three. Uh, okay, so... Wait, what? Two plus one plus three plus six, which is twelve. Not likely, because one of them is June. We don't think June would be evil. Uh, the second one, Ace plus Clover herself. Why would she do that? If we assume that June, Clover, and I aren't evil, Clover hasn't done it. We know Clover hasn't done it. That one doesn't work because Clover hasn't done it. Me and June? Yeah, right. One, three, seven, eight. Now that one's a bit more suspicious. That one is potentially possible. Because none of those people are us. F1468, June would never do it. June and I would never do it. Me and Clover would never do it. What's this? These are the combinations for three or four people. These eight combinations are the only possible ones. Oh, I see. Junpei? Yeah? I... I can trust you, right? Yes. Of course. Why would you need to ask that? Really? Yeah. So then I should get rid of B, D, G, and H, right? Yeah, because it's got me on it. Of course. Just cross them out. And you should take off yours too. The ones with four. So, what does that leave? It leaves two. A and E. June would never kill anyone. Wait, it can't be A. Why? Because June's in that one. There's no way in hell she'd do something like that. Are you sure? Yes. I bet my life on it. Okay, then. I can cross off A, too, right? Yeah. Well, what have we got left? E. And that already has Seven and Santa in it. Just add in Ace and Lotus. And that'd be a full-blown conspiracy you know theory. What this means? Everyone besides me, you, and June would be working together. Do you think that's likely? No. Hmm. If there were four people working together, they wouldn't be very cautious. I don't think they'd try that hard to hide what they were doing if they outnumbered us, right? Well, you do have a point. Okay, that, that's very clever reasoning then, Clover. Well done. And besides, if Ace and Seven are working together, they could have easily gotten rid of me when I went to the shower room with them. But they didn't. They didn't even try anything. If they were killers, why wouldn't they? Her voice was calm, but Junpei had only to look her in the eye to know it was a forced calm. There were some tears forming at the corners of her eyes, and she was blinking furiously to keep them back. Perhaps by attempting an objective analysis of who might have killed her brother, she had been able to distance herself from the harsh reality of his death. The more she struggled to act unconcerned, the more Junpei felt his heart tighten. Oh, I see. Anyway... I understand now. It seems pretty unlikely that it was as many as three or four people. Which means it could only be Santa or Sev- uh, Santa and Seven. Yeah. Then that means there's a good chance it was Santa and Seven. That's how it looks. But why would they do it? There was a moment of silence. Their motive. He laid his hand gently on her shoulder. He was close, so close to the answer. 
And Ace comes back in. God damn it. That's the thing, though. What is their motive? What is the motive for them? He raised a knowing eyebrow and then spoke. Have I interrupted something? No. Uh, uh, what is it? There was something I wanted to speak with you about, Junpei. Could you come with me for a moment? Yeah, sure. All right. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Junpei looked over at Clover, who gave her a short nod, hoped that she would be willing to talk to him again later, and followed Ace. Okay, so getting through that, we want to then head to the captain's quarters. Red file. A red file lay in the drawer. Junpei reached down and picked it up. Huh. Looks like, Looks some like there's oh. something on the cover. A all ice. Alice. There we go. Does this mean... Junpei couldn't hold back. He had to know what was in that file. Each page was covered with strange characters. They look like tiny drawings, hieroglyphs. Yeah, we've seen this. What the hell is... Th they are hieroglyphs. Yeah. Ancient Egypt? That's right. Can you? Of course. I can't. Skipping. What the hell? Junpei flipped through a few more pages. It wasn't just one or two pages, it was all of them. Whoa, that... I'm just trying to wait to see if we unlock anything now. Junpei wasn't going to waste any more time with them. He made to close the file. That's when the keycard oh. falls out. We've done this. Oh. Uranus. Just gonna skip the Uranus Something's card, Uranus card. So it would see. Bottom deck. Oh. Junpei remembered something he'd heard from Seven when they'd been in the chemical closet. Okay, pausing a second. Bottom deck library. Ah! Okay. I know what this is gonna reference now. Seven said something like... Yeah. Alice, Alice sleeps, sleeps in a small, in a small chamber, chamber past the forest, forest of knowledge beneath, beneath the navel of the gigantic... Called it. <laughs> could beneath the navel mean the bottom deck? And the forest of knowledge is the library? Then could Alice be in a room somewhere beyond the library? We could find Alice. What's wrong? Something on your mind? On no, your mind? no. Junpei blinked, only then did he notice Ace looking at him curious, uh, with curiosity and concern written across his face. Um, yeah. I just remembered something. Is that so? What about? Well, don't laugh, okay? There was no reason for Junpei to hide his thoughts. He began to explain his theory to Ace. Then he stopped. It wouldn't make any sense if Ace didn't know who Alice was supposed to be. So he told Ace everything June had told him. Okay. The Egyptian Priestess and Ice Nine. Interesting. And the woman who wouldn't melt, who was recovered from the Titanic disaster, they called her All Ice, which eventually turned into Alice. Makes sense. And she was purchased by an English millionaire who called himself Lord Gordain. According to Seven, this ship is where he hid Alice. So she's hidden on this ship somewhere. And you think that he hid her in a small room, beyond the library on the bottom deck? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is just a theory. Hmm. But it's one that we could really try looking at. Uh, his hand slowly, absentmindedly stroking his beard. Ace stared off into the distance, wistfully. After a few moments, his hand stopped. He turned slowly to look at Junpei, and his brows drew together. Junpei, have you ever heard of the term CAS? No. CAS? It stands for Cells Alive System. It is an advanced technology for freezing and preserving organic matter. Okay. Put simply, it is a technique that allows one to freeze things without the formation of ice crystals. Sort of like how Alice is frozen. Normally, if you freeze something fresh, water within its cells expands as it crystallizes, damaging the cell membrane. CAS, however, works differently. The object to be frozen is supercooled using magnetic fields, and then frozen instantly and uniformly, giving ice crystals no time to form. Okay. That's an interesting concept right there. It was originally developed for the preservation of food, as an alternative to the normal freezing process. Now, however, there are rumors that it can be used for other things. The problem with Cass, though, is that it couldn't have existed in Alice's time because it's such a new de development. What do you mean, other things? Well, there are obvious medical uses, but perhaps also space travel. Excuse me? Space travel? Are you serious? Surely you've heard of suspended animation. Cryogenic freezing? Oh, so are they insinuating that Alice is cryogenically frozen? It's a fairly common idea in science fiction books and films. People are sometimes frozen for especially lengthy journeys through space. That was when Junpei understood what Ace was suggesting. Whoa, 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 wait a minute there. Ace looked at him and raised an eyebrow. Are you saying that Alice was frozen using that cast thing? Well, I'm sure the possibility is quite low, but it is a possibility. It's just dependent on if they had the technology at the time. 
if this special ice you call Ice-9 does indeed exist and Cass were used to freeze her into that sort of ice instantaneously. You think she could be alive? Well, I can't say for sure, of course. That would be insane. I'm only talking about possibilities. The melting point for Ice-9 is 96 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. If she were put somewhere where she could reach that temperature... <laughs> That's nuts. Are you really saying she could have defrosted and started walking about? At 96 degrees? It's possible. You're quite right. It does sound unbelievable. But if she had, then we would have an explanation for the man we found dead on the floor. Oh. Alice gone rogue? Alice murdering people? Could Alice be the murderer? You mean the oh, guy dressed oh. like a captain? Yes. He was dead when we found him. Clearly, he was murdered. But if he was murdered, then by whom? Alice. It couldn't have been one of us. That would be impossible. Because we couldn't go through the numbered doors to get to him. In order to enter the captain's quarters, one must first open door one. That door that requires the earth key prevented us from accessing door so one. So we couldn't have gone to get him. Who was it that opened that door? Santa and Lotus. Right. Clearly, the two of them could not have opened door one, or any other door for that matter. Who else, then, could have done so? Alice. Jinpei thought for a second. Nobody. After Santa and Lotus used the Earth Key, they turned back and met up with me and June. Then, we returned to the large hospital room and found Ace, Seven, and Clover. Exactly. While we'd gone into the shower room, Ace, Seven, and Clover had stayed behind. But it's impossible for those three to open door one. Nobody would have been able to kill this guy. Hmm, but what about when June and I took the elevator to door two? No, still won't work. We were only gone five minutes. No human being could have run to the captain's quarters, killed that guy in there, and run back that fast. It would be impossible for any of us to be the murderer. Pretty much. That being the case, who could have killed him? Wouldn't it make sense if his killer was someone who had been in the ship for some time? Like Alice. <sighs> A person like that would know the ship well. They would know the locations of all the hidden passages and secret doors. The numbered door would mean nothing to someone like that. It would be a simple thing for them to enter the captain's quarters. Then you're saying the killer was Alice? Potentially, if Alice is definitely melted out. We have no proof that Alice has been melted out yet. It was Junpei's turn to raise an eyebrow. Ace drew his thumb across his lips thoughtfully. Well, this is all only one possible theory. Huh. All ice. Alice, is she really somewhere on the ship? Jinpei had only one clue. The key card in his hand. Maybe this card will give me access to the Forest of Knowledge and the big mystery. What could be there beyond the Forest of Knowledge? Anyway, whatever. I'll come back to this later. Alright, he gripped the key card tight, I shoved it into his pocket, and now we go back to the menu. And we want to go to the monitor, because we're probably going to deal with huh. Clover. Okay. Yep, let's get to when we get to a it's like choice. Making... What do you think? Oh, he turned to Clover, who was standing next to him. Nothing. It seemed that she cared about little. Yep. We've been here. He gestured towards the corpse. What about him? Do you think that's really Zero? No, it's not. We've heard there's this. No way. Didn't I tell you? Yeah. Well, even... Uh -huh. Don't you get it? Wait, uh, there's no way that man could be Zero. The letters that spell Zero on the TV screen, the captain's clothes he's got on, okay. and of course, the bracelet with a Zero on it. It's too obvious. Oh, well, yeah, we've look, heard that. This is Zero right here. This dead body is Zero. Yeah. Isn't that kind of fishy? You're right. Only an idiot wouldn't see through something like that. No, that, that's not the point. So I'm not trying to make fun of them for thinking a trick like this would work. Oh, I think this is actually already on an alternate discussion. I'm sure they didn't think it would work. Which makes me wonder. Oh, why did they do it? It, it, it cut off. Okay. I think this is a challenge. A challenge from the person who's really behind all of this. He's making fun of us. <gasps> Don't you get it? If whoever killed this guy really wanted us to think this corpse was Zero, they'd never have put a bracelet on him. So maybe we want to collect the bracelet? Walking around with a Zero bracelet would be like hanging a sign around your neck that said, I did it! Anyone with a brain would be able to see that this guy is supposed to look like everything Zero is supposed to be, just like we did. <sighs> the killer must have known we wouldn't think he was Zero and put the bracelet on him anyway. So we should take the bracelet. Do you know why? Why? Like I said, 
He's mocking us. Too bad, suckers. This isn't zero. Where's the real me, then? See if you can catch me. It's the same bad joke a lot of criminals like to play. They'll just sit back and watch people run in circles. Where's this going, Junpei? That's really twisted. But it almost seems kind of childish. Yeah, you're right. It's really childish. It's like it's just a game to whoever this person is. That's what seems funny to me. But it is a game. The notary game. Junpei bent down next to the corpse. All right, let's get back to the point. Who killed this man? I don't know. And what's this guy's deal? How would I know that? If I knew anything, I would have told I'm you. I'm not asking her if uh, she knows anything. I'm just saying. You have no idea who he is. Why would I? Hmm. Junpei sat back on his haunches and thought. We should check and see if he's got anything on him that might tell us who he is. Give me a hand here, Clover. Huh? We gotta flip him over. How else are we gonna search his pockets? <laughs> Come on, Clover. Okay, uh, fine. Guess I'll do it. Junpei had no choice but to move the body on his own. Here we go. He grabbed hold of an area not completely covered in blood and shoved. It took a moment, but eventually Junpei felt the man's bulk begin to shift. But just as it did... Huh? Something fell. From the man's left wrist. His bracelet. Hey, it's the... The bracelet with zero on the face. Oh god. Yeah, he's dead. This man... He's dead, isn't he? We've been over this, Junpei. He is dead. Get over it, take the bracelet, move on. Huh? No, it's just... I... I guess I didn't really think about it until right now. If his bracelet's off, that means he's dead. Well, it's pretty obvious that he's dead. You don't really need to look at his bracelet to figure out that he's dead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess you're right. It is pretty obvious. Well, uh, he looks a lot better than the other bodies we've seen, though. <laughs> you know? That was a really awful joke, given one of the other bodies was her brother. I mean, if, if there wasn't all this blood, he'd almost look like he was still alive. <laughs> I mean, I know it's kind of a messed up thing to say, but he kind of has it better, you know? Dying from a bomb going off inside of you? Some of Snake's bones went right through his skin. I, uh, I think the explosion must have thrown him against a wall or something. Stop it, Junpei. You're going to annoy her. There was a broken bone just sticking out of his left arm. And... Uh, oh. Huh? Suddenly, Junpei realized what he was saying. How could he have been so... Cr yeah, exactly! But it was already too late. He turned to look at Clover. She was glaring at him furiously. What did you just say? Her words sounded... cold? He knew an apology could hardly atone for what he'd done, but he tried anyway. Oh man, uh, I am... I... I am so sorry. I... I shouldn't have said that. I... I really don't know what I was thinking, I mean... No, that's not what I'm talking about. Huh? What did you say about his arm? Well, he had bones sticking out of his left arm. Yes, his left arm! You said it, didn't you? Well, yeah, I did, but I mean, I didn't... Didn't you see it too? Of course not! I could barely look at him! There's no way I was gonna see the details! Clover took a quick, deep breath. Are you sure it was his left arm? Junpei thought back. Please be right. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. Okay. And he had a broken bone, right? What the hell are you getting at here? Okay. Just shut up and answer me! She shoved her face closer to his. He could see the fire in her eyes. Junpei winced and swallowed. Yeah, he did. Uh, it was pretty bad, too. The bone was sticking out of the arm. <laughs> what? No sooner were the words out of his mouth than Clover's expression changed. Clover? <sighs> What's wrong? <sighs> Look, I'm sorry if I said anything. Suddenly she was crying? Junpei wasn't sure what to do. What's going on? What, what have we discovered? What is wrong with the arm? Thank you. What? It was close to the last thing he expected to hear. Huh? Or, what are you... Junpei had no idea what had just happened. He didn't think he'd done anything worthy of thanks, and he couldn't understand why she would have chosen that moment to begin crying. So he simply stood there confused. Thank you so much, Junpei! She thanked him again, and then something even stranger happened. Whoa! Clover threw herself into Junpei's surprised arms. Hey, uh, what's going on with you? I'm sorry, it's just... I'm so happy! Happy? Why? The body in the shower room. It, it isn't his. <gasps> it isn't my brother. What? Huh? It's not Snake. What? Why on earth would you think that? Because his left arm is. She stopped herself. I'm sorry. I 
really shouldn't be talking about this. No, 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 come on, speak! Junpei decided it would be prudent not to press her for any more info- Like what? Like, is his arm like... Well, the only, the only explanation really is that his arm must be a prosthetic then, because that's the only reason why the whole bone thing would work, so... Damn, so that means Snake has a prosthetic arm, he's blind, he's had a really shit life then. But that means he's not dead, holy fuck. Okay. If she did not wish to tell him, she certainly had a reason for doing so. Perhaps more importantly, however, if Clover was so certain, then she was likely right. That meant that the body in the shower room wasn't Snake. It wasn't much, but that knowledge lifted some of the weight from Junpei's heart. But he's still alive. I'm, I'm so happy. So she's just got to find him. Where did he go? Tears shone in her eyes. Those tears melted Junpei's heart. As she cried, she had pushed herself up against his chest like a child. Junpei put his arms around her and held her tight. I'm so glad! Aww. <sighs> Junpei, you were- Huh? No matter what happens, you can never lose hope. You can never lose hope, as Makoto Naegi from Danganronpa would say. Always have hope. Do not give in to despair. You have to remember what's most important, and that's to have faith and to have love. If you can remember all of those, that'll bring you good luck. That's the symbol of the clover. Clover reached into her pocket and pulled something out. Uh, yes! It's the bookmark! Ah, I was laminated bookmark with a four-leaf clover. I, I only made it here because you gave me this. Aww. I was suspicious of everybody. I was angry and miserable. She really was. But because I had this four-leaf clover, because of what you said to me, I... Yeah. Junpei hadn't thought his words would have such an effect on her. Her words were making him feel a little awkward. Thank you so much, Junpei. She looked up at him. He scratched his nose and pretended not to, not uh, to notice something interesting somewhere else in the room. Oh, uh, if you really want to thank somebody, you, you should be thanking Santa. Santa? Why? Well, he was the one who gave me that thing. Oh. And the words for each leaf, I got that from him too. Oh. Um. Uh. Really awkward given she was like, you know, kill Santa. Uh. Then suddenly... Clover broke away from Junpei. Uh-huh. He looked confused. He hadn't thought she'd react that poorly. Clover began to pace around the room. Okay. What's wrong? Clover, six steps to the left, six steps to the right. Another six to the left, and then she stopped. Did... did Santa really tell you those things? Yes. Her eyes were serious, but not angry. Yeah, he, he did. Did I, uh, say something wrong? Oh no, not at all. In fact, this could be really good news, I think. Really? You think? Santa knew about the words and the clover. The only people who should know about that are the other subjects. What? Subjects? The other people who were in the experiment nine years ago, with my brother and me. Well, fuck. <sighs> But he's blind, and I was part of the Nevada test group. What does that mean? So neither of us would be able to recognize the faces of the people who were on this boat. Oh! Would the experiment nine years ago have been the experiment that Seven interrupted, and that's why he heard kids? That would mean that Ace has been on this boat before. No, not Ace, sorry. Um... Uh, got him with his uh, snake, I mean. So, if Snake was on this boat, Clover was in the Nevada test group. <sighs> Lotus's children, the the two kids, one of them was on the boat. The other one could have been with Clover. Maybe they the the Cradle Pharmaceuticals they kidnapped kids who were paired up like in duos. But if they kidnapped Santa, then... Who's Santa's pair? God, this is... This is just like... I I, I need to, like, really focus on, on what's going... I know what's going on in my head. I'm trying to say it to you. Let's just continue. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, time out. Junpei held up his hands. He took a deep breath and let it out. Let's just calm down for a second, okay? Start from the top. Don't start with the end and then jump to the middle. You... you you gotta start with one, and then move to two, and three, and four, and so on. If you don't tell me stuff in the right order, I'm never gonna be able to figure it out. Okay. 
All right, Clover nodded. All right, let's start with this experiment. What happened on this boat nine years ago? Do you know about morphogenetic fields? <laughs> it was an experiment to test morphogenetic field theory. Of course it was. Morphogenetic fields. He did, and the realization sent chills down Junpei's spine. All right, have yep. a theory of- I think Lotus- Junpei re recounted what Lotus told them earlier. Clover nodded. Hmm, telepathy, huh? Well, that's not really it, but I suppose it's similar. Fair enough. So they were testing telepathy on this ship? Yeah, I guess so. So, what exactly did they have you guys do? The same thing that we're doing now. Exactly the same thing. The nonary game. What? The nonary game. Nine people were put on this boat, and nine others were put in the building in Nevada, and the game started. What? Junpei grabbed the sides of his head. Look, I'm sorry, but I, I don't get it. What do the nonary game and some telepathy experiment have to do with each other? Am I missing something here? Clover bit her lip. She blinked back sudden tears. What had happened to her in Nevada? The ability to access a morphogenetic field is affected by a couple of things. Okay. The first is epiphany, and the other is danger. Oh. You know how sometimes when you're up against a really tough problem, and then the answer just kind of pops in your head? That's an epiphany. And danger would be putting them in an environment where the danger would make them have these epiphanies. And what you learn from the epiphany can be transmitted with telepathy. When you add danger to that equation, then it gets easier to transmit yeah. that information over telepathy. So you're saying the nonary game was supposed to introduce that element of danger? Yeah, but it couldn't be just any old danger. Had to be death. It had to be life and death and... Someone did actually die. A girl. Oh, God. Huh. Junpei felt the sudden grip of despair on his heart. Something deep and distant and powerful squeezed, and for a moment he felt very empty and alone. She was on the boat with my brother. Aww. I was in Nevada. I never met her, but I did hear her name. Uh? Her name was... <sighs> what was her name? God damn it, Ace. Junpei spun around. Oh, my apologies. I seem to have disturbed you. Ace. You two must have strong stomachs. Huh? I can't imagine how you could stay in this room for so long. Oh, well, it's just a bloody man. It's okay. Ace glanced down at the floor. He's dead. At the corpse covered in blood. You know, he's dead. At any rate, Junpei, would you be so kind as to come and help me with something? Yeah, of course. I'm having a little trouble, and I could really use your assistance. Uh... Come on. It'll only take a moment. Yeah, with that, he turned and walked back towards the communications office. Clover waited until he was out of sight, then spoke in a small, quiet voice. I don't want Ace to hear us. We can talk about this later. Fine. Huh? Hey, wait! He could have at least given me the name. From outside, Junpei could hear Ace calling. Junpei? What are you doing in there? Hurry up! Coming. <sighs> Grumbling to himself, Junpei stomped off towards the communications office. Alright, that's that. Now... I guess we go back to this. Okay, they stepped outside of the quarters. The hallway stretched out in front of Junpei for a bit. All right, let's go. Junpei rounded the corner and took off. Let's get the map. And let's. That's the next door. Yep. Let's see Wait, what changes. A piece of paper. Junpei skidded to a halt. Is... Yep, it's the map. Map. Let's skip to when we get to a point where we need to get to. <laughs> yep, Ace. I found a map. Yep. Okay. I see. Well, that was anticlimactic. Where's Clover? I should keep this, though. Is she still grabbing the axe? Uh, something hey, stopped him. Uh, where's... He turned around. Clover was nowhere to be seen. Damn it. What the hell? Okay. Please don't tell me she has an axe this time. She was standing in front of the door to the captain's quarters, her hand on the doorknob. Clover! Huh? As Junpei watched, she closed it gently and quietly. <sighs> what the hell are you doing? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? We are on the right path, right? Because this is exactly what happened last time. Clover had unconsciously put her hands over the pocket. Please tell me this time, Clover. What the hell is that? What? You've got something in your pocket. Oh, this? Uh, um, this is a note. Oh. A note? Yeah, I found it in the pocket of the guy with the captain's clothes. 
It said something about the darkness of the sinister hand or something. Oh. What the hell? Uh, let me see it. Uh, no, not right. But Junpei wasn't going to get to see it. From the other end of the hall, he heard Ace's voice. Hey, Junpei, Clover, what are you two doing? Hurry up. God damn it. He's getting mad. Clover shrugged. I'll show it to you later, all right? Come on, we gotta hurry. Well, at least she doesn't have the axe, I'm pretty sure. Does she? Around the corner and off down the long step? Uh. Yeah, she doesn't have the axe, thank God. Okay, Junpei was curious. A note, a note, there was something else that bothered him. From the look of that pocket, it doesn't particularly look like just a note. She probably took the bracelet as well, because we left it on the floor. Jeez, what are you thinking? Uh, for crying out loud. Junpei did his best to convince himself that it would make sense later and ran off after Clover. Yeah, chances are she's got the bracelet. Now the question is, how is this path going to end? Because it seemed like it ends fairly quickly. Uh, found himself in the large room. Big stairs, just like it says on the map. Yep, it was just what he'd expected to see. Uh, yeah, okay, Ace realized Ace. it. Yep. Is anyone down oh, there? There he is. Yep. Look, the four others are- Okay, everyone's really? there, okay. Let's join them. Junpei and Clover glanced at each other and hurried down the stairs. And we're gonna have the- Everyone, we found door nine! Junpei, Clover! Okay. What's up? Found door nine, found door we nine. We found it! Found what? We found it! What did you find? The last door! We found door nine! Nice. What? Come on! Just follow us! We'll explain on the way! Maybe this time we won't get stopped by Clover wanting to go to door two? Okay. Seven turned and jogged off down the stairs. Well, if that's the case... Wait for me. Let's go. We should... Jump! We... Yeah, we've, yeah. we've heard this, we've heard this. We've reached the end. Seen it, seen it. Skip it. Something's bothering me. Yeah, we've seen this as well. 4.30. We've only got... Hey! Come on. Let's go! June took off down the stairs, jogging as quickly as she could. Yeah. Alright, sea deck. No one's gonna stop us this time. Please don't stop us. Let's all just get into an elevator together instead. It's gonna be fun. We're actually gonna go see door number nine for the first time. That's insane. As a group, they piled onto the elevator and rode impatiently down to E deck. It looked too familiar. Uh, looked familiar. There was a metal grate. Oh, we're on the other side. Seven grabbed hold of it and began to talk. I know I told you I'd explain it earlier, but honestly, there ain't much to explain. After we split off from you guys, the four of us got into the elevator on the left, and that took us to the other side of the grate. Yeah. After that, we headed down another hallway. It took us toward the bow, and eventually to the number six that you two found earlier. We opened it and kept going. There was another locked door behind it, like usual, but this time we had to complete two different areas before we could unlock All it. Alright. Once we were through that door, there was another hallway that went the other direction, toward the stern. Okay. So, on your way, you found the elevator. Okay, so what we know now, there are two escape rooms we do in the, in the sixth pathway. That's right. So, in other words, you kind of did a lap, huh? Yeah, they went all around. You came from that side to this side. Yeah. With that settled, Junpei looked around. So, where's the number nine door? Over here. Seven began walking down the hallway that led toward the stern. <sighs> Junpei and the others broke into a jog to keep up with them. By the way... They had been walking for a while, June in silent step with Junpei when she spoke. You know, it's because of Santa that we're all here right now. Really? Huh? That all seven of us are going to door nine. What? You don't get it? Santa, Seven, and Lotus, what's their digital route? Um... Nine. Nine. It's That's right. They could have just left me behind and kept going if they'd wanted to. Oh, but they decided to stick around. But they didn't. Yes, because Santa wouldn't let them. He said, we can't leave June and the others behind. That's why we went looking for you guys. Oh, that's nice. And then you got on the elevator and went back to the central staircase. That's right. Hmm. Well, uh, I wouldn't have called that one. Uh, that Santa would be the one to stick up for you. I mean. Yeah, I'm quite surprised by that as well. Santa doesn't really seem like the type to stick up for someone, but he has good morals. Junpei felt his eyebrows knit as he considered that. Oh, don't get me wrong. Perhaps June had sensed Junpei's concern. I don't mean that Seven and Lotus said they wanted to leave me behind. We were just talking about it, and Santa objected to it first. Alright, fair enough. Is that so? Junpei was about to respond when... Seven suddenly stopped. We're here. Oh. In front of them stood a door. So, is this... Yeah. 
Junpei couldn't see Seven's face, but he could see him nod. There's no other place for us to go. Nope. Just look around. There's a big old iron wall at the end of the hallway. The other hallways on the left and right are blocked by metal grates. I see. It looked as though Seven was right. The door in front of them was their only choice. All right, let's get moving. He pulled open the door and walked in. <sighs> Junpei took a deep breath and followed. Oh. It's a chapel. It appeared they'd been telling the truth. No way. The first thing Junpei saw as he entered the room was the number. Nine. Like all the others, it was a rough thing made of red paint. The door it decorated sat on the back wall of a rectangular room. <laughs> Junpei ran up to it. The nine door. It was a large double door with powerful styling. Something about it was almost majestic, and it made the red paint look especially garish. We're finally here. Now what? Junpei grabbed the handle and shook. It didn't budge, but then he hadn't really expected it to. The red was bolted to the wall next to the door. Its display read vacant. No doubt about it. This is door nine. <laughs> oh, finally! This is the last... Junpei felt a flood of emotion wash over him. But still, they've got to pick two people to leave behind. He felt a chill down his back and his chest tightened even as his blood began to boil. There was a moment of complete silence. Junpei, look behind you. What? He turned around. Behind? What? Junpei could scarcely believe what he saw. Why? A door and a nine. There's another one. What? There are two nine doors. Hey, what the hell? What the hell is going on here? His words came slowly and his brain struggled to understand what he'd seen. On shaky legs, he made his way to the second nine. It was a small door set parallel to the door they'd come through, but in the other corner of the room. Nine. There was no mistaking it, the number, and if any more proof was needed, a red was bolted to the door. Uh, the one near the door. There's a red there too. That means... And of course it won't open. He grabbed the handle and shook the door, not because he expected it to open, but because he had to make sure it was real. But why? Maybe so two groups can leave? Why the hell are there two doors? It was Ace who spoke first. Do you think perhaps one is the right door and the other is the wrong one? Lotus was skeptical. I don't know about that. It seems unlikely. What makes you say so? Well, think about all the rooms we've been through so far. They're full of puzzles, but there are always hints about how to solve them. I'm pretty sure there aren't any rooms where we just had to go with our best guess and leave it to instinct to solve the puzzle. I agree. Do you really think that at the very end of the game, Zero's going to suddenly throw in something that depends entirely on luck? Then you're saying there's some sort of hint in this room. Potentially? No, I don't think there's a hint anywhere in here. Maybe it's just a case of two groups split up and they both meet up at the end of Nine? I searched it very well when I was in here before. I didn't find anything that might have been a hint, though. Hmm. Well then, that means... Yeah, both of these are the right door. I mean, if you think about it, Zero never actually said there was only one door with a nine on it. It is hidden, but seek, seek a way out. Yeah, seek a seek door. door. Yeah, not the door. So if there are two number nine doors, if we split it up right... That's not gonna work. Junpei blinked and looked up at Clover. She held out her hand. You've got a notebook and a pen, right? Can I borrow them? Yeah, here. Slightly confused, he pulled them out and handed them to her. Okay. She's gonna show us Look all the this. combos. Clover opened the notebook to a blank page and set it down on the desk. Everyone else gathered around her and watched as she wrote down a series of numbers. There are no ways. You get it? The numbers on the top are all the combinations with digital roots of nine. The numbers on the bottom are the people who don't fit. If we had Snake, then it would work. There's only eight possibilities if we split up into two groups of three or four people. So... If three people go through the door, then four are left behind. But if we had Snake, then we could make that digital route 18. If four go through... And we know Snake's alive! Left behind, we found right? out through Clover. Yeah. Clover nodded, almost as though she were pleased with herself for solving a difficult math problem. No way. <clears throat> hmm. <sighs> if we had Snake. The room went very quiet. Silence lay across everyone like a thick, heavy metal blanket. No one spoke. Their faces were blank. Come to think of it. 
Desperate for something else to look at, Junpei turned his eyes to the room around him. What is this room? The walls were covered with candles. The wavering flame made the shadows of Junpei and his companions look as though they were dancing. Two rows of wooden pews filled most of the room. It looks like it's set up for some kind of ceremony, but what kind? Between them was a strip of red, rich carpet. The carpet ran straight through the room, ending at the door that pointed to the stern of the boat. At the other end of the carpet... Is that an altar? And a coffin with a key code, or a key pass. There was a recessed space set into the wall between the two other doors. Sitting on a raised section of the altar was a coffin. A coffin. Could it be that- could that be Alice? No, it, it couldn't possibly be. But if it wasn't, then whose body occupied it? That was as far as Junpei wanted to pursue that line of thought. He decided not to think about the coffin for the time being, even though it obviously is important and a big thing. At that moment, Seven spoke. There was an edge of humor to his voice, but it was forced. Okay, I give up. I give up. I figured if we sat around here long enough, someone would volunteer. But I guess nobody's got the guts to do it. What are you talking about? Junpei didn't... Seven. What? You guys didn't figure it out yet? <sighs> fine, fine. Let me enlighten you. Clover was mostly right with her little explanation earlier, but she missed something. She wasn't really wrong, she just... Ah, screw it! Let me just write it out. Okay. Seven snatched up the notebook and began to write in it. Everyone else clustered around him, desperate for a look. If you're trying to leave with a group of three and a group of four and get everybody out, Clover's right. But there's another way. Only one combination, though. If you split us up into groups of three, three, and one, you can make this combination. Oh. Wait, this means... Don't get me wrong here, I'm not trying to copy Ace or anything like that. Even if he hadn't been the hero back in the big hospital room, I'd still be saying the same thing. Seven's a good guy. The same thing? Are you saying... Yeah, I am. I'll stay behind. Uh... uh. <laughs> uh, uh. Damn. Why are you acting so heroic all of a sudden? Are you some kind of idiot? Lotus was the first to speak. That in itself was a little strange. She'd reacted much differently when Ace had volunteered. No, I am completely against this. I'll be goddamned if I'm gonna have to owe you for getting out of here. The rest of them began to speak all at once. I'm against it too! I didn't want to leave Ace behind, and I don't want to leave you either! Well, if we had Snake, we wouldn't have to leave anyone behind. I don't like that idea. There's gotta be other options. I disagree as well. I can't say I care much for you being the hero. Finally, they quieted- what about Santa? Santa didn't speak there. Finally, they quieted down. Junpei looked at Seven. Well, there you go, Seven. Proposal denied. Clover's right. There's gotta be a better way than this. Seven made some noise that was somewhere between a des derisive snort and a cough. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. He was doing his best to pretend they were making a foolish decision, but Junpei could see the twinkling of water at the corner of Seven's eyes. That was when Santa spoke. Whoa, hold on a minute. I haven't said anything yet. Until then, Junpei hadn't realized that Santa had stayed quiet for the whole discussion of Seven's fate. Something in his voice made Junpei uncomfortable. Are you... agreeing? You want to leave him here? Santa shook his head. Nah, I'm against it. I don't want to leave Seven here alone. Then I don't see how it matters. I said alone. He wants to leave two people here. Huh? I said I don't want to leave Seven alone. There was a dull shine in Santa's eyes. They were cold and hard. Junpei felt himself shiver. What the hell are you- What? You don't get it? I can't leave just one person. I need two more. What? Three people, including Seven. I'll be leaving behind three people. Oh, you asshole. That's my proposal. No, those are my orders. What do you mean, orders? What the hell makes you think you can order us around? Who the hell's gonna listen to you? You all will. In three seconds, you won't have a choice. What do you mean? What? Three, two, one. Santa was so fast, Junpei could barely see him. When he moved, it was almost like watching a dance. His feet moving like lightning. He spun around and- Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. He had June. See? I told you. Why? His lips curled into a cruel, mocking smile. Huh? What? A shudder traveled the length of Junpei's spine. 
His chest froze and he could feel his breath go stale in his lungs. Nothing made sense. Junpei felt as though his head were about to explode. Unlike June's, which is probably going to get blown up. Um, Santa's sudden change in attitude, saying that he needed two more. The gun in his right hand, a revolver. Santa had grabbed June from behind and pressed what Junpei's shaken brain identified as a revolver, roughly against her temple. Why? What the hell is that? Where on earth had Santa possibly found a gun? Junpei's questions roared in his mind, but his mouth refused to answer them. Seven spoke almost as though he had sensed Junpei's confusion. The gun's from the other room. What room? One of the rooms behind door six. Shit. I should have known he was going to do this. Should have taken, taken the gun. Ah. <laughs> well, it's too late now, fat ass. Damn it. A mixture of fury and frustration twisted Seven's face as he glared at Santa. Santa, for his part, didn't really so much as flinch. The corner of his lip twitched into a slightly wider smile. <laughs> then the smile faded, and he began to move. He walked backward, dragging June with him. Before long, his back was resting against the door. I want to see where I am on the flowchart at this point. Jeez. I'm just going to check the flowchart. Yep, I'm still there. But damn, this is a long segment. On the wall next to him was the red. He put his hand on the scanner panel quickly and then forced June to do the same. So that'd be three plus six, now, which is nine. Time for you to start following my orders. So he needs nine. So it would be probably me, which is a five. And then Clover, who's a four. Ace, Lotus, congratulations. No. I've chosen you to come with me. Oh, fuck you. Put your hands in the red. No. That was what Santa had meant when he said he needed two more. Hey, you deaf? I gave you an order. Santa's eyes narrowed to slits. He glared at Ace and Lotus. <sighs> they stayed frozen like deer caught in the headlights of an oncoming car. Right. Fine. I didn't want to waste any bullets, but you guys just don't get it. No. No sooner the words out of Santa's mouth than his hand twitched. <gasps> and the gun roared. A section of the floor exploded, scattering wooden splinters across the... Okay, so he's just proving that it's real. Oh my god. Huh. There could be no doubt that the gun was real and worked. He really shot it? But why? Santa, why are you... Clover's voice spoke a betrayal in disbelief. Santa, I thought... I thought you were one of us. I thought we were friends. Well, I was just saying earlier about how his morals were pretty okay. Not so much anymore. What? You knew about the leaf words and the four-leaf clover. Sa Santa's cheek twitched almost imperceptibly. What the hell is that shit? I've got no idea. You're lying! Ooh. Shut up! Just shut up, you stupid bitch! You want me to put a bullet in your fucking head? Don't you dare. Flecks of spit flew from Santa's mouth, his face twisted with rage. Clover recoiled, her eyes wide. When she spoke, her voice was very small. Santa! He snorted, then shook his head vigorously and turned to face Ace and Lotus. All right, assholes. What are you still standing there for? Get over here and scan those bracelets. I don't have all day. Oh, what's the matter? Your hearing's starting to go? Going senile, maybe? Uh, motherfucker. <sighs> Ace and Lotus still didn't move. It's almost as if they couldn't move. June's face was pale behind Santa's arm. Her eyes were wild and her chest heaved with every quick breath like an animal cornered by a predator. <sighs> Jinpei's mind worked furiously. What were they going to do? Then he realized something. There was nothing they needed to do. There was nothing to debate. That's it. June's safety was the first priority. That much was obvious. Doing as Santa had commanded meant that she would be safe from at least two threats. She wouldn't be shot and she would leave the ship alive along with Santa, Ace, and Lotus. There was only one thing for Junpei to do. It's the only way. He turned to Ace and Lotus. Please, go. You're, fuck huh? you're fucking over Clover though. No way. Jumpy, what are you saying? If you stay here, you're going to be stuck, Jumpy. And so will Clover and Seven. I know, but you don't need to worry about us. We'll figure something out, right, Seven? Uh, right. Damn it. Just leave it to us. Wait, let me think. Let me just think about this. Uh, Seven. If we could get Snake, we could go through the other nine door. I'm pretty sure, because I think our digital route would reach 18. It's gonna piss me off to do what Santa says, but... Don't worry about me, either. 
There's still something I have to take care of. Agreed. No, no, you can't! Ace, Lotus, don't come over! Don't worry about me, please! June was almost crying. <laughs> Junpei walked around behind Ace and Lotus. He gently placed a hand on each of their shoulders. Please. And pushed them toward the door. Uh. <sighs> they almost stumbled, then righted themselves and took another step and another. <laughs> they turned around and Junpei nodded. Go. Oh, all right. Fine. Damn it. Ace and Lotus turned around again and walked slowly toward the door where Santa was waiting for them. After what seemed like an eternity, they stopped in front of the door marked 9. Santa smiled. Alright, now let's get those hands on the scanner panel. <sighs> What's the hold up? What? You think I'm fucking around here? I don't give a shit about this girl. Shit. The rag doesn't need a person, you know? It just needs a bracelet. All I need is the bracelet. You get it? Good. Now put your fucking hands on the scanner. I'm not gonna say it again. Just do it, guys. We don't want June dead. He shoved the revolver harder against June's head and she winced. Fine. Ace sighed, defeated, and placed his hand on the scanner panel. Lotus went next. <sighs> Lotus glared at Santa and slammed her hand onto the scanner panel. I hate this. The four fast tricks blinked on. Good job. Now, Lotus, pull that lever. As soon as the door opens, you get your ass in there. Try anything stupid, and you know what happens, right? Damn it. Junpei could almost hear Lotus's teeth grind. Alright. Naturally, we can't see anything beyond it. The door slid open. Door number nine opened at last. It opened with a low, powerful rumble. A drum roll to welcome the chosen few. Good. Go. Lotus and Ace walked through the door, their eyes furious but defeated. Santa waited until they were all the way inside, then hauled himself and June across the threshold as well. Here we go. Later. And that leaves us behind. After exactly nine seconds, the door swung shut. The gust of air it created caused the candles on the altar to flicker and die. <sighs> Damn it. The room fell silent. Is this an ending? We'd been left behind. Uh. Clover looked down at her hand and traced with her finger the faint blue veins that crisscrossed them. <sighs> Seven shoved his arms into the front of his overalls and scratched his stomach. No one spoke. Silence made the air feel thick and oppressive. <sighs> Desperate for something, anything to occupy his mind, Junpei walked to the larger of the two nine doors. He stood in front of it and looked at the red. It red engaged. He moved to the smaller door. Vacant? Vacant. God. The digital root of the remaining people was seven. Yeah, if we had Snake, there was no possible way for them to open the door with the nine on it. Junpei touched the surface of the door. June. He thought about June, about Akane Kurashiki. Was she safe? That was all that mattered to him. If she was alive, if she had escaped this horrible boat? That was what Junpei prayed for. Seven came up next to him. He pulled off his hat, scratched his head, and sighed. So, what do you want to do, Junpei? What have we got to do? What do you mean, what do I want to do? What can we do? He opened his mouth to respond when... A noise echoed throughout the room. Someone was pounding on something vigorous at the coffin. The coffin in the keycard. It wasn't mechanical, it was certainly human. Junpei and Seven looked at one another. What the, what the hell, hell is that? that? Oh, that was a spoken line. Shh, quiet! Clover motioned to Seven to be quiet. She put one finger to her lips and closed her eyes in concentration. It's coming from the coffin. The three of them listened, trying to determine where the sound was coming from. Where is it coming from? The coffin. Could it be? Uh, hey, I think it's coming from this coffin. You're right. Let's open it. But how? What are those muscles for? You're telling me to force it open? Just shut up and try! Jinpei and Seven grabbed hold of the coffin. They tried to get a good grip. 
with what little purchase they could find, and pulled with all their strength. Damn it! It won't even budge. There was some sort of keypad attached to the coffin. Its purpose would not have been difficult to determine. Their eyes almost immediately drawn to it. Not another one? Yeah, looks like it. Do you think we have to put in the right password or it won't open? I think so. The noise wasn't stopping. In fact, it was getting louder. Whoever or whatever's inside this thing wants out. And now. And we need to figure out the passcode. I know that. But how? Without a passcode, I, I don't think there's much we can do. They couldn't even tell how many numbers the passcode needed to be. Isn't there a hint somewhere? Well, let's look for one. Unfortunately, there didn't seem to be anything near the coffin. Clover ran to examine the pews and Seven investigated the desk, but they turned up nothing. <sighs> There's nothing here! Not making this easy, are they? The sound still wouldn't stop. It wasn't a noise that belonged in that room. <sighs> Damn it. What's the passcode? What am I supposed to do? How can we figure it out? I need something. And what could it be? We haven't found any. God damn it. <laughs> to be continued. Unfortunately, that's the wrong answer. Actually, I'm Santa? What? Okay, now it is time. Let our game begin. Okay, let's save it. Save here. That's the coffin ending, I'm going to assume. Okay, well, in that case, guys, that is the end of the episode. That was a long one. Uh, so we got the coffin ending. And next time... We're going to be heading into door six. There's not really much else we can do. So with that being said, it's the end of the episode. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If you're watching on Vidme, don't forget to upvote. If you want to play the Nonary game for yourself, then take a look at how many views this video has, and you can work out the digital route to find out what character you are from the game. And in the next episode, we're going to take on door 6, and we're going to finish off 999 by going down these last few paths. We've got a lot of story to go. We still don't know who the murderer was from this path, although now I'm thinking it could be Santa, and he could have faked his death. But yeah. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.